everyone. I'm Glenn Howard, president of the Jamestown Foundation. We're happy that you're joining us for another episode of Eastern Approaches. This interview series is named after the famous book of the same name by former British diplomat, spy, and adventurer, Sir Fitzroy MacLean. Each episode of Jamestown's Eastern Approaches features conversations with renowned experts on the most important geostrategic issues facing the United States and Eurasia, particularly those areas of the world often missing in today's headlines. Today, we are taking you to the regions of the far north between the Arctic and the Baltic to focus on the country Finland and its important role in regional defense and security. Finland occupies a very important strategic location in the Baltic due to its large neighbor next door, Russia. The historic legacy of tiny Finland captured the hearts and imaginations of those in the West during the 1939 Winter War when Finland fought alone against the Soviet Union. During that time, Finland earned the respect of Europe and the Soviet Union for its determination to resist Russian aggression. As many of you know, the founder of modern day Finland is Marshal Gustav Mannerheim, who was a president, soldier, and spy in the great game. And he played a critical role in the defense of Finland in 1939 and its historical struggle against the Soviet invasion. In honor of his achievement and the continuing strategic importance of Finland, we're happy to have with us today, Yuri Reitzelo who is an adjunct professor of strategy and security policy at the Finnish National Defense University. Yuri, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, good. thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. and I really look forward to the discussion. I, th I think the discussion, the way we want to go today is certainly we'd like to ask you your perspectives on what has happened in terms of Finland's defense and national security strategy and planning uh, since tumultuous events of February uh, 2014, when Russia invaded Crimea, annexed Crimea, uh, certainly being in the neighborhood of a neighbor to the east as large as Russia creates a lot of nervousness uh, along the periphery of Russia. And certainly Finland has a great history in trying to understand and, and adapting to that. So my question to you this morning, how has Finland evolved in terms of the events of 2014 and its defense and national security strategy? And how has that process kind of evolved with the lessons learned of what you saw happen in Ukraine? And, and in many ways, it probably didn't affect Finland's national security strategy because Finland has always had a mass conscription army, a very large reserve force to tap into, uh, and a great military experience and tradition. So just kind of walk us through what's been happening with Finland since 2014 in terms of its own uh, military Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, and it's going to be a little bit long answer, I'm sorry. That's fine. We got all, yeah. we got all day. So, yeah, so if, if I start, you know, a little bit uh, further down the line in history, uh, looking at the kind of watershed events of, of when the Cold War ended, I think that the kind of the main way within the West that the, the defense strategies, security strategies, and militaries transformed was to kind of look a little bit more outside, out, out of area, and the military is transforming into all volunteer forces, smaller forces doing expeditionary operations. But in the Finnish case, I think we, we kind of uh, stuck to the territorial national defense outlook. Transforming, yes, going smaller, yes, better capabilities, yes, but still having the focus on our own territory and, uh, uh, and defending against external military threats and, and against potential military pressure. So in this regard, I would say that 2014, actually showed us that there is still kind of relevance in this world for having this kind of a, a territorial defense based larger military uh, for deterrence purposes in order to uh, to prevent the military threats from arising so one could say that the, in the finnish case you know the world that we are living today with higher tensions this is precisely the world that we have been building our military for for the last decades so in in, in this way i would say there are not too many surprises uh, then you ask about what has been going on since 2014. I think that the, the main kind of change that we have seen during the last six and a half years is, is more, more, more resources to readiness, military readiness, you know, kind of very quick response capabilities. That is the first point. The, the second point is we have continued to, to upgrade our, our interagency uh, way of operating against different kinds of threats. There's a lot of talk about gray zone. There's been a lot of talk about hybrid threats during the last six years. And I think that uh, we have been developing this old Cold War era concept of total defense into a comprehensive security model for the last 30 years. Uh, and uh, we have continued to, to do that uh, during the last six years. So whether it is you know, man-made 
threat against Finland, political, economic uh, pressure or military pressure, or something coming from totally different sources, you know, migration, terrorism, uh, natural disasters, whatever. There's kind of a robust system of authorities uh, planning together, exercising together, and also uh, operating against different threats. So I think that will be the second, second aspect of, of how we have been responding. You mentioned this something very interesting about you've been upgrading the, the, the interagency process now, and you mentioned the idea of the gray zone. So what you, so Finland has been more, it seems, um, trying to understand how to respond in a quicker way in terms of little green men or something emerging on the border. And, 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 I, and, and I think that that is, is that, is that what you were kind of alluding to is the fact that, that being able in within your own decision-making process inside Finland to be able to identify and respond faster? Yeah, I would say that that would be it, uh, but, but it's not, you know, just 2014 and what happened during that year and after that. Uh, I think it was a kind of a decades long process of turning the Cold War era total defense where all the society was preparing to help defense any which way they can if there was a military, a military threat or a war. And we have been changing that outlook into a more comprehensive security model against a, a whole, whole variety of a bigger spectrum of threats within the interagency processes. And that started in the 1990s. So, you know, we have been doing this for the last 30 years. And I think that the, what, what we saw at, uh, in, in Crimea and the discussion about gray zone after that, I think that just highlights the, the new elements within this broader spectrum of different kinds of threats that we could face, the society could face or the state itself could face in the future. Well, I think that's a very interesting point because, you know, that's been the whole problem within NATO uh, is its own decision making process uh, on how to identify when Russia uh, or how NATO reacts to a crisis and being able in, within the decision making process to uh, encourage mobility. And uh, General Mattis, when he was uh, Secretary of Defense, was very much an advocate of trying to, uh, of the concept of the 430s, of the rapid mobilization of NATO forces within 30 days. Uh, of different contingents and units. But, um, but Finland has always had a, a very strong focus on mobilization. And, and I wanna say that, you know, uh, in some of your articles, you talked about the importance of the 2008 war with Georgia. I think that Finland uh, was probably one of the few countries that was trying to study the lessons learned of the 2008 war because you saw that war transform. And unfortunately in the United States, uh, because of the reset button uh, that they set with Russia, uh, they kind of took the eye off the ball in terms of understanding what were the lessons for that. And, and, and that, again, that boils down to territorial defense and, and mass mobilization capabilities. Is, is Finland now, um, have you, has Finland been trying to uh, develop a faster way of trying to uh, mobilize its forces uh, in terms of testing and, and, and preparations and readiness levels? Uh, ha has, that, has the tempo increased? since 2014 in terms of how Finland looks at the situation? Yes, uh, yes it has uh, and I, I agree how, how, how you are describing it that uh, during the last six, six, six years or more that is that has been kind of the main focus uh, because I think that we have the capabilities we have been we have been de developing these uh, capabilities for territorial defense for decades there has been no stop in that but but the main main kind of lessons of, of the last years has been that the military crisis uh, and, and military threats can emerge very quickly so uh, that has been kind of the, the main effort. I would say that, you know, it's really normal for the, for the Air Forces and the Navy to be on a constant readiness, you know, there's patrolling, uh, guarding of the airspace and guarding of, of, of sea areas and so on. But, you know, it's, it has been the, the biggest change for the Army to have these instant readiness forces 24-7, 365 days a year. So in a way, one could say that, you know, the Finnish Defense Forces in part change more from a kind of a training organization of the big reserve into an readiness organization during the last uh, half decade. Well, I think the I think uh, the Finland has certainly looked for every possible way to try to be um, improve its defense forces and and its interoperability. Also, uh, interaction with its Baltic neighbors uh, has increased. Um, and how has you seen the situation in terms of the Baltic? And in, in, in your own perspectives, uh, I'm not asking you as a diplomat. Uh, or to be a diplomat, but uh, certainly uh, Sweden took its eye off the ball uh, and really lagged behind uh, in terms of military, its own military forces, armed modernization development. But now you see Sweden 
rapidly with the exercises in Gotland trying to uh, up its game in the Baltic. And is that, does that, is that pretty reassuring to Finland because it allows you to kind of focus more on, on the more direct threat? Uh, how does how does your you know what are your perceptions about how Sweden is interacting now in the Baltic? Yeah, if if I frame uh, the Baltic states and Sweden into a little bit bigger framework, I would say that uh, for us for many years, uh, kind of increasing defense cooperation has been really important. And I think that w when you are doing defense cooperations with others, it's really important that you have capable capable partners. Then then the cooperation is useful. So uh, I think that uh, you know. Uh, Military cooperation or defense cooperation—that's not—that's not, that's not uh, kind of a, uh, an effort to try to save money. I think it's it's an effort to do more with others. And in order to be able to do more, you need some partners that that are capable. Uh, with Sweden, we have a very nice, quite deep going defense cooperation that has been moving really fast during the last years. So so I think that uh, what Sweden has been doing uh, is really reassuring uh, for us uh, here in Finland as well kind of a returning the, the focus on, on own territory closer to home on, on military threats and, and trying to prevent those from arising. Uh, what about the Baltic states? Of course, they are members of NATO, Finland and Sweden are not. So I think their kind of a defense guarantees and their defense is focused on, 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 on that forum. We are, we are a partner, but not a member. So I think that, that that is kind of a big difference between, let's say, cooperation uh, uh, with Sweden or with the Baltic states vis-a-vis -vis. Uh, A good friend of mine who was a former defense minister of Georgia uh, once conceptualized uh, the idea of Georgia not being a member of NATO but being NATO-like. Uh, so acting in many ways like it's a member of NATO but not being an official member of NATO. So uh, I guess, you know, certainly Finland has been interoperating more with NATO. Uh, I think that you're starting the uh, the, the cooperation with Estonia. Uh, I mean, there's been some joint exercises, I believe, uh, and there's been growing more uh, activity. C how can you describe kind of your interaction with Estonia and how that, how has uh, Finland's defense thinking changed? Well, yeah, uh, about the Estonia, we are doing, uh, of course, we are, we are living so close. We have uh, the same security environment. Uh, we see threats and, and security in, in a quite similar fashion. So, of course, there, there has been increased cooperation, uh, among other things, uh, procurement. But I would say, uh, in, in all, all, again, in, a, in kind of a broader context that, you know, we already made in Finland the kind of a, the decision, political decision, something like 20 plus years ago, that we will, we will develop the military according to Western standards, meaning NATO standards, uh, uh, whether it's procurement, whether it's training, whatever you have. So I do think that, you know, this, this process of, of being interoperable it's not just a product of the last five years or, or, or ten years even. It's, it's a long process. Uh, and I would say that the same applies to the Baltic states. Uh, after the NATO membership, they have been kind of uh, uh, preparing and, and getting better at, at their own military uh, exercises and capabilities, building them from practically scratch. So now there is something, uh, something you know, worthwhile uh, to cooperate on. So I think it's, it's much mutually beneficial. Yeah, I definitely think that, that, that you know, uh, it's very important to, uh, the, the, the common view of Baltic security is very similar, uh, but it does benefit because of the benefit of Estonia, uh, because it does have a neighbor like Finland with the military experience. And how is, how is you, there's been a bit important decision was made today, uh, recently in the last couple of days about Finland has been, I believe 50% of its uh, current defense budget is going to be spent on the F-18 purchases. Um, and Finland has made a, a very heavy investment in its Air Force air capabilities. Uh, I'm sure your grandfather and, grand, and, and relatives who fought in the Winter War would have appreciated having the type of air power that you have now. Uh, but Finland did fight very valiantly in the Winter War with the limited air force that it did have. So you did have some fighter aces. Uh, but, but going into the current context, how do you see uh, this F-18 purchase, I mean, it really is going to give you a lot of capabilities to, to, to deter your neighbors. We have some 60 F-18s now, right now, and, and we purchased those in 1990, oh, 1992. So they are running out of their, their useful uh, time in the service, so we are now replacing those. We have five candidates. Uh, the government is going to make a decision next year on the replacement of, of the current Hornet fleet. 
uh, that the price of the purchase is going to be 10 billion euros. Uh, and actually, it was a couple of days ago when the Finnish government uh, made the budget proposal for the next year, uh, and that the kind of the, the budget uh, noted that starting next year we will increase the, the defense budget significantly. Actually, next year it's going to be 50, 54 percent more than this year because we are starting to pay for those those incoming fighter planes. Uh, the first planes will be arriving in, in 2025 and the last ones uh, supposedly in, in 2030. So it's going to be a five or ten year process of, of getting the new planes to replace our current fleet. And it's, why it's, did you... It's, yeah, sorry. No, no, well, why did you... Uh, so it's interesting that you're going for the F-18 because it does have more of an air support component for, for ground forces is my understanding. Uh, but instead of the F-35, I mean, what, that, that's kind of an interesting that, that Finland made the strategic choice to go with the F-18s. Uh, yeah, but we did, we did that th 30 years ago. So we are now getting, getting rid of the old F-18s and we are replacing those. And we have five candidates, two are from America and, and three from Europe. And there hasn't been a decision which one will, will be the next fighter, fighter plane of the Finnish Air Forces. So it, it will, th this decision will be made next year. So we don't know yet which is going to replace the aging. aging so you're saying that they, Finland may still get the F-35s? They are one of the candidates, yeah. They're one of the candidates. Yeah, we have five candidates uh, and, yeah. the, and the, the kind of the tender process and the acquisition process, is, it, it's not completed yet. Well, you can't let the, the Norwegians get too far ahead of you, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so. But, but you know, as, as these really big material projects go, you know, you have an aging problem. You are, you are you are starting to lose the capability, and you are also losing the capability vis-a-vis -vis of the relative capability vis-a-vis -vis the other states around you. So our our current fleet of the fighters they are really coming to the end of their useful age. So we we, ha we have to replace them now, and it's of course it's going to be a big investment even during this COVID nineteen crisis, which might uh, influence in some countries defense budgets. But, but but we are going to do this with extra additional money on, on the defense budget. Well, I think that's the, the Finland's great benefit. It's, it, it never took its eye off the ball. Uh, and, I, and I think that the, uh, you wrote an article in the Comparative Strategy uh, about how Americans are so focused on technology, the, re the revolution of military affairs, expeditionary warfare. Uh, those were all some great points you made in your article that you wrote in 2014. Um, and, I, and, and you reiterated it, and, and, and Finns continue to talk about uh, the concept of the army and the people and, and the fact that mass mobilization uh, and the, the ability uh, to deter large ground forces with a population that is supporting you. And, and you mentioned the, the importance of territorial defense. Um, I'd, go ahead. Yeah, you know, it's really difficult to compare the U.S. and Finland because the scale is so totally different. Uh, I would say, of course, that we also value technology, uh, but, at, but at the same time, as you mentioned, I think that the human dimension is really important. And uh, for us, kind of the, the center of gravity uh, in, 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 in big part comes from the population. It comes from the, from the willingness of the people to support and, and to fight. You know, there was this Gallup poll uh, five years ago uh, done in Europe. Uh, and every country was asked the same question, the people in every country in Europe, would you fight for your country if, if war broke out? Uh, the Finnish, the Finnish uh, population said 74% yes, I would. Mm. Uh, the average in, in Europe was something like 35, 30%, coming, ranging between something like 18% of the population population saying yes to 40%. So I think that the figures are totally different. And, and I, I do think that the uh, when most of the European states have moved to all voluntary forces, it has influenced the way that the society at large sees the military and the military tasks. And, and, uh, and after many years or decades of all voluntary force, the kind of the connection between the population and the militaries gets, gets uh, weakened. And that is a problem. Well, that's a, you know, you, you, that's a very, very good point you make. And I know that in addition to your day job at National Defense University, you're also a movie star actor in Finland now starring in a uh, defense video about Finland's military preparations uh, that just recently appeared. Uh, so now you're kind of a media star. So how does, um, you know, the, the, the video that the Finland produ produced is very important because, uh, and tell us about what went into that and the video uh, about how you're trying to get, is, was that more designed for the Finnish population 
uh, in, in terms of a mental approach to, or just to remind them about it? Or is it just a, a message to everybody that, that Finland's ready and prepared and we know you're going to be coming? Uh, yeah, I think that this video that was done by the Finnish Defense Forces called Battlefield 2020, uh, the main audience is our conscripted force. It's our conscripts and it's our residents. To kind of show, show for them uh, what we expect on the modern battlefield. How, how does a crisis start? How could it start? What kind of elements could it include? Cyber, uh, different gray zone things, things that are not military or they don't look military in the beginning. How does this kind of crisis, how could it evolve? And what kind of responses would the Finnish Defense Force give? So I think that will be the main, main audience. But I think uh, because we have this general conscription system that uh, every household has at least one citizen soldier in practice. So we are also telling the families and the people who are serving in the military or are in the reserves, we are, we are also giving them the story. But how we see that uh, their loved ones would be, what kind of crisis, in what kind of crisis would they be uh, defending the nation? And of course, I think it's also a message uh, outside so that everybody can see that we take our, our security and defense seriously. And how did you uh, disseminate that video? What was your kind of strategy? Was it put it on Finnish uh, television networks or how was it, what was your strategy in trying to get it out to the population? Well, you know, it's on YouTube. So I think it's, <laughs> yeah, so that's the easy part, yeah. And then of course we're using it for the training in, in the defense forces. So, so we are using it uh, on, on a kind of a daily basis in the defense forces and every, anyone who wants, would like to see it just can, uh, just can go to YouTube and look Battlefield 2020 and they can see it. Is that something, is a video also shown to conscripts or when they go in? Is it, is yes, it? yes it is. Because I think it tells in a kind of quite a con concise format about how could a war start and what you need to do to be prepared. So it's not always just, you know, the tanks rolling over the border. There is quite a lot of other things in, in modern crises that would happen. I wanted to ask you a, a question about the, the, the importance of geography and the, the forested terrain uh, of Finland. Um, we, we as Americans have a tendency, as you know, uh, to get hung up on technology. But... Um, I was talking to a Latvian friend of mine and who was discussing the Latvia's decision uh, process about whether to get Javelin anti-tank missiles uh, or to go with something like the Spike, uh, the Israeli anti-tank weapons. Uh, what is the, the, the forced terrain? Um, my, my Latvian friend said uh, and told me that, that the Latvians had this decision about the javelins because of the, uh, the dense forests. And, and that when you're using anti-tank weaponry uh, in forced terrain, you have to take that into consideration. The, is, how does Finland kind of looked at this issue about anti-tank weaponry uh, and taking on heavy armor? Yeah, well, you know, I think that uh, first of all, you know, as we're preparing to fight on our own territory, I think that that is kind of the bonus for us so that we know the territory uh, we can prepare there we can train there uh, year out, year in year out so i think that is the kind of the first 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 aspect about it the, the, our own territory and and so on uh, concerning anti-tank weapons uh, yes there's quite a lot of uh, uh, forest areas or or areas where the visibility is not that long range so of course that has a certain kind of uh, uh, implications for the, for the for the weaponry we have uh, it means that uh, there's quite a lot of uh, expendable short range anti tank weapons in use but also longer range because we have also the areas where where there is long visibility so so I, I do think that you know when you are when you're thinking about building defense capability you need to have layered systems you need to have different kind of systems that that, that complement each other you you, you don't you can't do the trick to, with the one super super system you, you need a layered system whether it's air defense whether it's anti tank systems coastal defense uh, you need you need several systems that have a, they all have their kind of good good aspects or good spots but there are also the adverse adverse uh, uh, aspects in all the weapon systems so when you have several weapon systems and you can combine them in a, in a useful way uh, and you can plan this all ahead of time before the crisis comes i think that that that, that is a good thing that we can rely on well, what what is the what is your go-to anti-tank weapon in uh, Finland? Well, we have a, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, anti anti-tank uh, weapons that that we are using. Uh, they are they are delivered throughout the troops, and then we have several missile systems. So so it, it is kind of a broad range of of, of systems. <laughs> Let me ask you a question about um, the impact of of 
of climate change uh, and the weather and what, what type of conditions are you seeing and how is that affecting Finland's uh, preparations or views of, of, the, of the changes with the global climate? I mean, is it affecting your defense strategy in any way? Are you uh, are seeing, I, I'm going to ask you later a question about the Arctic, but I just kind of want to segue into that question uh, by what, how is that affecting you? Yeah, well, it's not affecting yet, I would say, or at least not in a major way. Uh, we expect that it will have uh, influence over the long term, mostly in a way that uh, as we have these Arctic conditions throughout the country uh, at some part of the year, uh, so I think that the, the, the effects of climate change will mean that uh, this kind of a harsh winters, lots of snow uh, is going to be, uh, it's going to come to a lower lower level in, in the future. But, but this, so far, the changes are not that drastic that they have changed kind of the strategy or the, or the way to, to prepare the events. But they, it could have over the, long, over the long term, but I think we are talking about the decade or more uh, when okay. we can see the actual results on that. Okay, let, I'm going to uh, switch now to your neighbor to the east and talk to you about some of your perceptions of Russian military modernization and what you've seen with the Russians. Uh, most importantly, they've um, reopened in 2015 this uh, base, uh, Alakurti, uh, which is uh, very, uh, was an important, it was an important airfield during the Second World War, during the Continuation War. It was used uh, to bomb uh, the Murmansk Railway uh, to try to sever that. Uh, and now at the, end of, uh, at the end of the Second World War, they, they retook that area. Uh, but you've seen the Russians move um, in, in greater, they've reopened that base. They're now uh, in a centralized position that, that is kind of affecting, it appears to be affecting your own defense strategy because they're, they're starting to put more things there. They're using jamming capabilities uh, and, and GPS jammers and things like that. How, how do you see developments in Alakurti affecting Finland? Yeah, if, if I first look at a little bit about the kind of the Russian modernization program as, as a whole, uh, I do see that uh, for, for Russia's uh, great power status, uh, the military might is, is one of the most important, if not the imp most important thing. So they have, been, they have been resourcing military modernization quite heavily during the last decade or so. So I do think that we, ha we are already witnessing uh, quite a lot of results from that, whether it's new nuclear weapons of, of different kinds, whether, it, whether it's uh, coming new fighter planes, uh, new equipment for the, for the army and, and so on. So I think that they, they have been really putting money, money into this uh, conventional, uh, higher, more high, uh, higher technology based uh, weapon systems. Uh, and, and also uh, I think that, you know, as the tensions have been going up, they have they have continued to do this at a higher resource level, so I, I think that would be the general point. They have been doing they have been doing this for, for a long time, preparing for a, for large scale combat and, and deterrence. Uh, then, what comes to this base that you mentioned in Alakurti, which is on the Arctic area, close to the Finnish border, uh, it is an old. Uh, it was a it was a Soviet uh, Soviet garrison or or a base that was closed down after the Cold War ended, and now it has been reopened. I think that just that is quite a small force. It's it's a brigade. Uh, but but still, I think it's, it represents the importance of the Arctic sphere for Russia. Uh, I do think that they have they have been they have been opening quite a lot of uh, old uh, bases again. Uh, they have been building uh, new infrastructure on their Arctic coastline and, and close to that. Uh, they reorganized their their command up north on the on the Northern Fleet Joint Strategic Command. Uh, and so on. So I, I do think that they take the Arctic area very seriously. Uh, there are maybe good reasons for that. You know, the, quite a lot of, uh, of the melting in the Arctic areas, the, the new resources, uh, hydrocarbons and so on that, that will become available is something that they, they want to secure. And also during this heightened tensions uh, between Russia and the West, I think also they're looking at also from a defense, defensive perspective, kind of trying to safeguard uh, what they have in the Arctic. So I do think that the the Arctic area is one of the things that Russia has been resourcing uh, quite quite a lot during the last maybe five years or so. Well, the Russians have recently, I think, in uh, uh, several years ago, they created the new Arctic Command, uh, and there seems to be, uh, according to people I've spoken to, a division uh, a division of labor between the Western Military District and then this new Arctic Command, and that the Arctic Command. 
uh, is headed by a Russian naval commander. Uh, and there seems to be more kind of a, a focus coming out of that Arctic command uh, on Norway, Russian perceptions of Norway and the Arctic. Um, and, and kind of how is that, how, how has that changed things? I mean, how do you, do you see less emphasis on the Western military district or the same level of modernization? I mean, getting the same level of equipment or, or is it, how do you see that changing? Yeah, because I, yeah, I think that the, the Arctic Command, as I understand it, is based on their, their Northern Fleet, the Northern Fleet Joint Strategic Command, which has kind of the, the crown jewels of, of Russia's uh, nuclear deterrence forces, uh, quite a lot of the nuclear subs, the second strike capability. And it, it also covers the Arctic. So I think it, it is really important for Russia. And I think that it has always been, because the Northern Fleet has been really important. The Kola Peninsula has been really important. It was for the Soviet Union and it has been for Russia. Uh, yes, I think that uh, the Western military district, district is also important. It is the district that is facing NATO, that is facing the West. And I think that quite a lot of the modernism then it moves on over to the other districts. So I think that this is a kind of the focus area from the Arctic to the, to the Western military district uh, here, here in Europe. That is kind of a, uh, one, one could call it a center of gravity about uh, defense transformation, military transformation and so on. Hmm. And do you uh, and how do you see uh, do you see a, a role for China in terms of China's growing involvement and interaction with the Arctic? How is uh, uh, is is Finland going to be a part of the One Belt One Road initiative? Or uh, I mean, how is how what are your kind of perceptions about uh, China? Well, yeah, I, I think that China is more active uh, on a broad range of issues, whether it's economical, security related, military issues, and, and, and also concerning the Arctic. So uh, I would say that uh, you know there there's a there's an item to see how does this uh, closer relations between China and Russia, uh, how are they influenced these relations by China's uh, growing interest in the Arctic area. So mm -hmm. I, I think that is going to be one, one kind of the aspects of, of this multipolar system that we are now facing. How does this, this relationship uh, evolve, uh, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the, the Arctic area? How, how have you seen, uh, switching to the Baltic, how do you see uh, the Allen Islands. There's been some discussion uh, about the status of the Allen Islands. Uh, as you know, the, the most of the population are Swedish speaking. Uh, and during the Cold War, it was certainly a topic of, of interest. Uh, but how do you see uh, the Allen Islands changing in terms of uh, a Finnish strategy? Uh, you know, Allen Islands, they are part of Finland. Uh, and Finland will defend those islands if there is a crisis. But, but, but based on, on international treaty, they are demilitarized. So we don't have military installations there and we don't have troops in, in the Owen Islands. But if, if, if a crisis comes, then we will, we will have a military forces and we will defend those islands. Uh, so had, I, uh, I don't think the status have changed that much in a threat towards the territorial integrity of the Owen Islands, uh, not during the last six years or before that. But, but they are part of our defense planning uh, and, and our, our, con our contingency planning about how will the Finnish defense forces defend those islands if need be. And, and do the people, local people in the islands, I assume they serve in the Finnish army, they're they part of the conscription pool? They can if they want, but they, they are not part of the compulsory conscript system. Uh, that is part of the kind of the, the neutrality of the islands, the, the demilitarized uh, they get, it gives aspect them, of the islands. So, so people can, they can serve if they want. So they can, okay. Huh. But, but how does the, um, um, how do, are there, I guess, so they are demilitarized and there's no bases on the islands. Is that correct? Or military facilities operated by the government of Finland? Is it, is that part of the new um, demilitarization aspect? That, that is right. So we don't have military installations in the Orland Islands. We don't have, we don't have troops uh, training there. We have, we, we can, we can have our naval ships on the territory of waters and so on, based on the rules of, of this kind of international treaty concerning neutrality and, uh, and uh, demilitarization, but we don't have permanent troops there. I think that is the key point during, during peacetime. Has there been some debate inside of Finland about that at all, uh, about changing your position because of what's happened with Russia's growing assertiveness in, in the Baltic? At least in Finland, we haven't had any kind of a serious discussion. Uh, about changing changing the status, uh, it's based on international treaties. So I think that uh, changing status would also need to need to kind of reconvene all the all the signatory parties of, of the of the treaty, uh, if we would like to do that. But there has been there hasn't been any serious discussion about, it. and it's also part of the kind of the right. identity of the people living at the Orland Islands about uh, the neutrality and the militarization. So that's not an issue at the moment. It hasn't been at all. 
and how many many NATO experts have talked about the Baltic in terms of Kaliningrad is, is a very vulnerable aspect in Russian strategy, uh, overall strategy, because it is isolated. But, but many experts point out that for NATO, um, that it's a thousand kilometers from Warsaw to Tallinn. And, and so, in, and you're familiar with the military concepts of A2AD warfare, that, that Kaliningrad is a bastion uh, for air defense and, 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 and anti shipping missiles. Um, Wearing your hat as a military planner, I'm not asking you to um, uh, to to give advice to NATO, but but if you're uh, talking to Americans uh, about how we our own strategy in the Baltic, what type of recommendations would you have? I mean, in terms of uh, dealing with this problem of Kaliningrad, uh, trying to get forces in and out of the Baltic. I mean, do you have any kind of recommendations or concerns for the United States and its NATO allies? Well, well, I think if you look at the map, uh, yes, as you described, Kaliningrad is an exclave uh, within NATO. Practically, it's a uh, quite a small area with Lithuania and, and, and Poland. So I would, I would say that uh, uh, it's not simple for Russia to maintain it if there comes a, a military crisis or war. So uh, if you look at the Baltic Sea area, it is practically an inland sea of NATO and the European Union. Uh, there is only kind of Russia has two, two areas, the Kaliningrad area and the St. Petersburg area at the bottom of the Gulf of Finland. So, so it will not be easy uh, uh, for, for Russia either if there comes a military crisis concerning Kaliningrad. So I would say that quite a lot of the discussion that we have seen about A2 and AD uh, and uh, the, the role of Kaliningrad um, during a potential future war, uh, there has been quite a lot of hype also. Uh, I, I do think that the, the discussion in, about A2 AD is quite a lot, a lot about uh, Western vulnerabilities, uh, about how Westerns, some, some, they lack some capabilities. Uh, they, for example, many, many, many uses of air power during the last 30 years never had. So I think that, you know, moving perspective from, from counterinsurgency, moving the perspective from crisis management towards uh, peer competitors or great power, potential great power conflict means that there's going to be a different kind of adversary. And this means that we are going to need some new kinds of concepts, uh, how to, how to operate. So I, I do think that the A2AD discussion is, is, a, is a Western discussion, but it has many capabilities that from our point of view, uh, who, who are thinking about, uh, uh, long, long range air defense, long range coastal defense as a threat have some problems to deal with. But, but I would say, just to answer your question, that uh, I think that there also Russia has uh, a really big interest in the Baltic Sea area uh, to see that, uh, that relations don't turn sour in a way that there would be a shooting war. Uh, Kaliningrad would be really hard to defend uh, under those terms. <clears throat> but some people, uh, NATO planners and scenario developers, have uh, Express concern about Estonia's vulnerability to its islands, uh, to the Estonian island archipelago off the coast, that it's very vulnerable to Russian, um, to a Russian uh, action of sorts. Uh, that if they put anti shipping missiles and air defense S 400s on one of those islands, they could create a complete air defense corridor uh, from Estonia to Kaliningrad that would uh, be a form of denial capabilities for NATO. Um, how do you, how do you, do you agree with that? I mean, do you think that, that NATO, uh, has more, needs some type of aspect of better kind of capabilities to, to deter Russia, uh, in the Baltic for these vulnerable areas? Because we tend to look at Russia from a landward perspective, you know, the, the military threat they pose on the borders, but Russia does have some capabilities at sea to move things around. Uh, they shut off the Baltic uh, for military exercises periodically, um, just to uh, screw around with uh, with commerce in the Baltic. Um, in fact, they launched a ballistic missile, or uh, they they did a an, from an SSBN in St. Petersburg. They they did a, a, a nuclear missile test. Uh, not I think it was a year year and a half ago they did a testing uh, a test exercise. I should say they didn't. I don't think they actually fired a missile, but. Uh, what do you think of that? I mean, that, that dimension, the maritime dimension of the Baltic. Well, yeah, you know, first of all, I would, I would like to, you know, I, would, I can't really find the rationale for, for Russia to start a conflict uh, of, of taking territory, uh, taking NATO territory to any other territory. I, I think the logic is really hard to come by. Uh, what, what would that be? I don't think that that is kind of a, what the future holds in the Baltic Sea region. But I do think that, you know, all states, 
have the responsibility to kind of show and uh, that they have and to develop uh, defense capabilities so that uh, they are bringing more like stability in, instead of instability. So I, I do think that, you know, whether it's, whether it's the Baltic states or whether it's Finland or Sweden, I think that we have the responsibility as sovereign states to be able to monitor our own territory and to defend it if need be. And of course, concerning the Baltic states, as they are part, part of, of, of NATO member states, I, I do think that it's important that uh, NATO has uh, plans for the Baltic uh, states area as they now do, as they have for, for all the other areas concerning NATO. But, but, you know, the kind of the basic logic that what you're asking, I would, I would ask uh, what would be in Russia's interest to do that. Uh, you mentioned the commerce in, in the Baltic Sea area. I, I would say that Russia also has a, has a kind of a positive interest also to, to make sure that the Baltic Sea region doesn't turn into a, into a, into a crisis area when, when you know, connections uh, and, and trade routes would be affected because that would, that, would, that would be negatively influencing all the parties in the Baltic Sea region, Russia included. Well, you... Um... You talked about something early on in the discussion about total defense uh, and how Finland was preparing for total defense uh, and the concept in the Cold War was total war. Um, and what we've seen with Russia has been a tendency along its periphery to fight limited wars. Uh, the idea to go in and seize a territory, pause, then negotiate, and then uh, hoping that NATO and its allies uh, become involved in very uh, long discussions on how to react. Uh, I don't think Finland has that problem because I think Finland would react in a way uh, that would be to deny Russia that capability. But I am concerned that NATO allies, um, there could be something Russia might use uh, in, an order, in an effort in the Baltic to neutralize NATO's response, to create green little men uh, hop, uh, appearing on islands uh, and doing things that that cause people to uh, confusion. And, and I think that the Finland has a centralized information system to be able to reach its population, I think. Uh, but unfortunately, we don't have that in all the, the NATO member states in the Baltic. Um, even in Sweden, there's a debate about how much involvement they should have with NATO. Um, but this idea of limited war is something I, I was curious as to what you might think, how your perceptions are on that. Uh, you did talk about total defense, uh, but it, it seems the Russians think in a different kind of approach to warfare uh, than we have in the West. You know, uh, I think that when we're talking about this uh, kind of overt military aggression, whatever the threats are, uh, I do think that, you know, the best way to be resilient is to have a kind of functioning society when, when your own population feels that they are stakeholders in the society. People are starting to uh, ask, uh, wh why, why are we doing uh, certain things in, in response to the, the threats that we are facing? So I think that kind of, in, in, the, in this way, national unity, so that everybody is part of the society, is really important. And there are no quick tricks to do that. Uh, it's, it's a long-term thing, you know. You need to have good education on, on the people. You, you, you must make sure that, you know, polarization of the society doesn't move forward and so on. So there are quite a lot of things that you need to have to have in order to get this healthy society and it takes decades. So there is not kind of a, any single magic trick that would be, would be helpful, whether it's you know, disseminating information or, or going after uh, fake news or whatever propaganda there might be. Uh, the better way to do that would be to have an educated people who have the medical, uh, media critical faculties in, uh, at, the, at a good, good rate so that they understand what kind of media messages are, are possible and what are not, and so on and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, the best kind of a, a policy against these gray zone things is to have a good, uh, good working relations with all the authorities. But then it's also it's really important that that people feel that they are part of the society. Yuri, um, in 2018, there were 769,000 Russians visited Finland, uh, and as a result, after the events of Crimea, Finland tightened some of its visa rules. Uh, for Russians coming to Finland. Uh, this concern about little green men, people coming in as uh, tourists. Uh, there was also the, the well-known documented episode of a Russian oligarch that had uh, um, operated a, a house on one of the, the, the Finnish islands that had a helipad and had boat houses and speed boats there. Uh, so obviously Finland had some concerns that those facilities were raided by Finland uh, and, and certainly made front page headlines in the West. Um, so how would you, you know, with the visa restrictions and concern about Russians coming into Finland, 
Uh, I mean, what are your perspectives about, I mean, 769,000 Russians is a lot of Russians to come to Finland in 2018. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure uh, that has an economic side to it as well. Yeah, it, it has an economic side. And I think that the Russian tourists are really welcome in Finland. I think there's a, a big branch of the, of the Finnish kind of tourist, uh, tourist uh, sector that is really happy that we have Russian tourists coming in uh, because of, of, of the money that they, that they bring in. Uh, concerning uh, visa regulations, uh, I think we follow the European Union guidelines. So that, that is kind of a framework that we are, we are, we are cooperating uh, with all the kind of European partners. We have similar, similar kind of policies, whether it's sanctions about Russia or, or visa policies or whatever. So that's kind of a common European way of doing things. Uh, you mentioned about this one case uh, that got a lot of media attention about, about the, in the Finnish archipelago, a property owned by, uh, by a Russian native. Uh, I think that the, this showed quite well uh, the media hype that we had. Uh, and you mentioned also that there was some heli heli helipad in, in the property. Uh, as, as it turns out, uh, it, was a, it was an economic uh, crime investigation uh, that we are having there. Uh, but of course, the media started to ponder about uh, Little Green Men and you know, upcoming invasion. But I think that was practically absurd, the, the discussion. Uh, it only took uh, a couple of days or weeks, the kind of the media frenzy. And I think after that, the, the discussion has been a little bit more normal about people realizing that there's a criminal investigation. We have the Federal Bureau of Investigations and the, the Finnish one working on it. Uh, and uh, we hopefully get some results. Uh, but as you know, when we are talking about economic crimes or suspected economic crimes, it can take months or years uh, to do the investigation. Uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, taking a long time. But, but there was no kind of a, uh, any kind of a directly related security uh, aspects to this. Uh, but, but the number of, you said the number of Russians coming to Finland actually has dropped uh, in recent years, uh, probably because of the downturn in Russia's economic situation. Is, is that correct? That is correct. The, the number of people coming in uh, changes uh, concerning or, or, or in direct relation to how the, how the Russian economy is doing, how, how people are, how well are they doing. So, so when it's when it's bad, bad times, the ruble is uh, is weak or whatever, uh, then there, there's less people coming in for tourist reasons. And, and when the economy is doing well, there is more. And I, I do think that there are there are quite many businesses in Finland also that are getting a, a, a quite a, from tourism uh, from Russia. Do you think they might loosen the visa restrictions at some point uh, to encourage more visitors uh, to get it back up? Or do you think that the security precaution will remain? As I understand it, it's a European-wide thing. So it, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a European Union thing and it has a lot of diplomatic uh, aspects to it. So it's not just a Finland only thing, how, how we deal with that. Uh, so I think that the, it's, it's going to be within the European Union and, and that is almost 30 states. So there are quite many opinions. So I don't expect any quick changes in the near future. Well, we're, we're starting to run low on time, and I, and I would like to, um, to ask you in, a, in a, 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 one of our final questions today about what are your perspectives about hybrid warfare? Um, you've written a lot in your writings about uh, Western concepts of, of defense and security. Uh, but you've also feel very strongly about, uh, about hybrid warfare uh, Finland actually has created a center for hybrid warfare, if, if I understand correctly, um, and, and devoted a lot of attention to this issue and topic. But so what are your perspectives about this term? Is it, is it overblown? Is it exaggerated? Uh, are we kind of ignoring some things at the expense of others? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question, Glenn. Uh, I think that for, for me personally, hybrid warfare reflects uh, the notion that uh, that maybe something has been neglected within the Western security community during the last 30 years, you know, being focused uh, so much on, on uh, non-great power adversaries or, or competitors, wherever they might be. Uh, so I think that some, some states and some people have forgotten that, you know, big powers, great powers use quite many tools to get what they want in the international cooperation or international system. There are, there are negative ways and there are positive means that, that they might be using, but it's, it means that uh, I think it's quite normal for the United States or China or Russia to use information tools, economic tools, you know, military tools, diplomat diplomatic tools, uh, in combination in, in trying to get what they want to, to serve their national interests. So I do think that as a comprehensive strategy of trying to optimize the national interest. So uh, I think that it's a new label, it's an old phenomenon, uh, and we should have known better. Uh, I think it will take several years for us to kind of get this gray zone hybrid perspective uh, be becoming a normal thing. Of the, of the great power competition or the multipolar world that we are now living in or turning into uh, when there are several power centers in, uh, in the globe 
that are having competitive visions about how to deal with each other uh, and how to how to kind of maximize their own interest vis-a-vis -vis the others. I know that some of my own colleagues uh, are torn by the fact of use of the word gray gray areas. Um, and, and the reason that they disagree with that concept is that there are no gray areas. When, when if, if a country moves into your territory, it's very, it's not gray, it, it's, it's one of national defense. And so uh, the term gray can also imply that there's a series of vagueness and uncertainty. Uh, and that the use of the term by gray is also, uh, can imply uh, hesitation. Uh, and I, and I, it's kind of interesting that you, you brought up the term gray. I know this is a quote unquote buzzword used to here in the West, uh, like hybrid warfare. Uh, but what are your perspectives? Do you think gray is, is all, uh, gray area is also kind of hyped up too much? Well, you know, I think we need these buzzwords for a certain period of time. They, they are the red flags that we have, a, we have a, you know, a new phenomenon for us now that we have to deal with. But I think that over time we should put these new new slogans or, or buzzwords into perspective and try to make a coherent patterns won't do much. So I think that we, we need to be a little bit more intellectual about use, how to use them and what do they actually mean. But of course, quite often it's enough when you say the right words and then you sound like an expert. <laughs> well, well said. So well, for, we'd like to thank you on behalf of the Jamestown Foundation for you taking your time today uh, we're to, to talk to us uh, with this episode of Eastern Approaches. We very much want to keep having indigenous voices, people from the regions of the world that America should be concerned about, telling us about your own concerns about your own security and exchanging views. And I, and I appreciate you being frank and open and, and willing to meet with us today. And, and uh, we appreciate and hope to see you again in the future. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Yuri Kaitsalo, uh, who's speaking with us today from Finnish National Defense University, a colonel. Uh, and Chair in Defense Strategy at Finnish Defense University, National Defense University. So we're very much thank you for appearing today, uh, Yuri. Keep moving, moving, moving.